So if we're trying to answer the question of where WordPress is placed in the creator economy is, I don't think we need to, uh, to work out what WordPress is, but I wanted to dive into what the creator economy actually means. The term's been around for a long time and doesn't really represent anything new. It's that very broad, encompassing term of people who create digital content and make a living from that. So that used to be called an influencer, but now it can be anything from a blogger to a TikTok uh, to a str uh, Twitch streamer and more. Because it's such a broad and encompassing term, it's really hard to evaluate the size of the market of the creator economy. But people who have tried to calculate this have placed it at a 100 to 200 billion dollar a year industry at the moment. And with all these people coming in, there's no shortage of platforms and tech companies, uh, investors that are trying to build products to get a part of that, uh, but also to innovate and to optimize the systems that these creators are using to do their day to day. But what's more relevant to, I guess, WordPress and the work that we do is uh, what I would call like the editorial creator. And that's the phenomenon we've seen more recently in the last couple of years, where people at traditional media companies are getting up and leaving and going out alone to set up a newsletter or a subscription site or something like that. The reality is with the way uh, these platforms are becoming increasingly easy to use, the barrier to starting a media company or any kind of online publishing platform like this is becoming increasingly easy. And that's why I guess it's interesting because this could potentially be the, just the new standard of how media businesses get started, uh, starting out as a creator uh, and then growing out from that point. So it's really the next generation. Um, and I guess the reason I'm interested in this space compared to the day-to-day, -day, which is working with much more larger, complex uh, media and publishing work, is during the last couple of years, like everyone, found ourselves with a bit of extra time uh, being grounded uh, and not being able to travel. So unlike some who learned how to make sourdough, I thought I would get involved in this sort of creator space and figure out what are these people doing? What are they motivated by? Um, where is the technology platforms? Um, you know, what are they using? How are they using it? Uh, and then obviously, where does WordPress fit into that whole equation? And hopefully learn something out of that process. So for the purpose of the talk, I think it's useful, like anyone who works in projects, to have a couple of personas to frame the conversation. And the first persona, which is the most common one we see, is this popular journalist who has a, a prestigious job, they're the food writer for the New York Times or whatever it is, and then one day they just decide that they're going to go out, and, out on their own, set up a substack, and uh, quit their nine to five and, and go it alone. They've usually got some sort of social following, um, and they can take that audience with them and sort of start off on day one with an existing brand and reputation and credibility. And the second persona is kind of similar, but I guess it's almost the evolution of the first one. And that's the small collective. So it's still a group of people who have come out of a, a well-known institution, set up their own thing. Um, they're typically uh, still coming from a big background with a big audience. But unlike an enterprise or a sort of corporate media company, they're still acting and behaving a lot like a startup. They're still figuring out how do you make money in today's age with media and publishing um, and sort of are moving a lot faster and a lot more sort of agile than uh, where they may have come from. So the simple requirements for a content creator, sorry, for a creator or an editorial creator is you obviously need to publish content, whatever format that is, whether it's written, audio, video, whatever. They need to make money, uh, and that comes in a few different forms, whether that is selling uh, and then managing subscriptions of some sort. Uh, maybe they'll go down the path of advertising, so that's corporate uh, uh, commercial options and things like that. Or they'll sell digital products, uh, things like ebooks, courses, gated content, so on. And then the final part that a lot of these creators are uh, really embracing is the building and supporting a community that holds this all together. Uh, the idea of a creator is it's a much more one-to-one -one relationship with the audience rather than sort of a name at a big traditional masthead that doesn't have that kind of intimacy. So building and supporting the, uh, the community is a really important part of their retention strategies. And that may, be the uh, may take form of like the comment section, forums, pro like private messaging, things like Discord, and so on. Unofficially, these are like the trendy platforms I see a lot of people going down if they were going to go down and create a uh, new uh, media startup, um, specialty SaaS. So these are kind of like the platforms you see that are designed exactly for this, uh, this sort of edge case. 
So Substack uh, has sort of really made its name in the last couple of years and gets an awful lot of coverage uh, on sort of it being one of the big catalysts of this newsletter revolution that's happening, uh, or at least being reported on happening. Beehive is another that was founded by uh, a few of the people who used to work at Morning Brew, who have been sort of one of the big uh, winners out of the last couple of years, uh, delivering newsletters and making them cool again or, or sort of um, reinventing that process. And then you have things like Memberful, uh, Patreon, where they have sort of like CMS Lite tooling. Uh, Ghost has obviously been around for a long time. They're an open source platform. I've always known of Ghost and I've never really dug into it too much, but in the last couple of years, they've really doubled down on building their product around this sort of digital creator space. Their marketing and product really uh, fits that space nicely and uh, is a really low friction entry way to using um, an open source product to do this sort of thing. And then obviously the last category is like no code, low code sort of page builders, your web flows, square spaces, and so on. So these platforms obviously are really easy to set up um, and get going, which is one of their biggest advantages. The entire UX, so the whole back end, everything that the actual user, uh, like as in the, the editorial person is working on, has been designed just for that workflow. WordPress often gets compared as like the Swiss Army knife, so it's kind of the, um, you know, it, it has to support everyone's workflows in different ways. So these products are designed just for what they need to do and make it really easy to do that. And often they have this low or no cost upfront model. So you can sign up for a, a, an account. Maybe there's a subscription fee or maybe it's like a rev share model where when you start to make money, they start to take some money as well. But I think a lot of these platforms inevitably hit a point for these sort of creative businesses that want to grow and, and um, scale that the, the nature of the restrictions on a platform are gonna cause them to inhibit growth at some point. And the way I kind of try and visualize that is thinking that you, if you start on day zero, uh, you're gonna get a tremendous amount of value from any one of these sort of products that you use and you're essentially paying nothing for it. So it's this really great trade-off for you. But at some point, and whatever that time is, the cost is gonna start coming up and it may not be a direct cost that you're paying, but it may be a rev share that they're keeping from you. Um, and the value is going to subjectively be going down because if your business is growing and they're trying to do more things, these platforms, the restrictions are going to start to be more present and um, start to be a bit more frustrating. So you're going to perceive the value of what you're getting for the cost that you're sending out to be lower. The challenge is always to figure out when that cross is going to be. That might be 30 days. If you're you know, three journalists with five million followers on Twitter, that, that cross could be in the first 30 days, but if you're looking at maybe a part-time side hustle kind of thing, that cross might be three years time. So it's figuring out when those sort of things are gonna converge. Setting up one of these products <clears throat> is pretty simple. It's, it's gonna be buying a domain if you need one, uh, registering an account, and then most of these products have done really well in onboarding because again, they're designed for one sort of edge case. So your onboarding will take you through and it'll set up all the things you need to set up to be able to start publishing content. Maybe you need to connect Stripe if you're going to take payments, things like that. So what does WordPress look like? There's a lot more steps involved, especially if we think back to those personas in the beginning. They're not product people, they're not tech people, they're not devs, they have no engineering background. So this is a very common thing and anyone who's worked in WordPress for any period of time kind of knows the friction of the working with WordPress will, will bring in. So you try and imagine explaining these sort of steps to a non-technical person and the sort of rat race they can go on trying to figure all of this out and hopefully not getting any step wrong along the way because it could potentially uh, you know, create further problems as they're setting other things up. So with all of that, why would you bother with WordPress? Um, I think for us, obviously, the WordPress agency, we believe in, in uh, the promise of WordPress and, and the benefit for, for businesses. So I think selling this sort of WordPress stuff to these creators uh, is really understanding what they're trying to do. Is it a, are we talking about a creator that is doing like the side hustle thing and they've got very low objectives and they're just going to be happy with that? And then maybe that's where a SaaS product works really well. But on the other hand, if they're going to be spending $100,000 a month on audience acquisition, they've got growth, ac uh, growth objectives that the product that they're going to land on needs to be sort of comparable for. I think people who work in tech also overthink or skip the basics. Um, we've been working with someone recently and you sort of gloss over the really basic things that you take for granted in a day-to-day. -day. Uh, they're doing you know, quite a large um, 
uh, product in this space, but they can't do things like simple email sequencing and stuff like that. So these are things that we would typically not even think about to, to do or be able to track conversions because the restrictive nature of the SaaS products don't allow you to uh, tie in the analytics the way you want or to do the ac uh, audience acquisition and analytics the way you want. And then obviously trying to be objective as possible, but at the end of the day, if, if we're talking to somebody who is considering using a platform like this, there's some pretty big risks um, and trade-offs that they're gonna have to make inevitably using something like that. <clears throat> so a lot of these are reasons you could use for WordPress in any context. I think in the case of media uh, creators and things like that, flexibility allows you to uh, build workflows and um, customize your application or your product to suit your audience. A lot of uh, these creators are obviously got the entrepreneurial kind of spirit if they're gonna leave a nine to five and go out and build their own thing. And what's really great about watching this space happen is that they are figuring out new ways to monetize their audience, how to capture first party data, build products and things like that. So flexibility I think is really important if you're talking to someone who's got ambitions of, of growing. Customization, uh, in terms of visual appearance, uh, most of these platforms will give you half a dozen options to configure, but at the end of the day, it's gonna look like every other Substack or every other Beehive or every other whatever else that you're using. Ownership, uh, for everyone who works in WordPress already, I think is pretty strongly about having access and ownership of your own data, ownership of content, first party data that you're tracking on your audience, comments, analytic, whatever that is. Um, is a really compelling thing for people who get worried about that. <clears throat> Access to your own data, again, is really important if you wanna move and migrate to another CMS. Um, it, it can't be understated. If you're building your, this product, the content is your product, to have it locked in a vault that you can't access or, or partially access uh, is a huge deal and, and in any other situation wouldn't fly. Censorship also is something that comes up once in a while with um, platforms. It's obviously a very touchy uh, area of, of where censorship and where platforms and VCs and, and investors need to draw lines on things, but definitely has been a concern people have raised um, about why they've wanted to leave platforms like this. And then obviously on interoperability between plugins and systems, uh, plugging in WordPress to some other system that may be really valuable to the, uh, to the product that you're trying to build. So how do you overcome these challenges uh, in WordPress? I think the first thing is this concept that's been bounced around for a while of like the WordPress light distribution. Um, <clears throat> there's not really an answer to it, but uh, on post that, I say had a podcast about it a couple of months ago. Um, and it's a similar thought I've had for quite a while of how do you build a sort of really tight distribution of WordPress that lets these kinds of users that want to be able to spin something up really quickly and push them through a, a journey to ultimately be able to do it in as few steps as some of the platforms can do. But it's just good to think about, I guess, conceptually with these other ideas that I have. So when we're doing these kinds of projects, and this was sort of some of the stuff we did over COVID, was did about 12 uh, sort of platform migrations away from different CMSs, substacks, and stuff like that for these sort of newsletter, subscription, editorial creators. And that's firstly to make WordPress feel more like a platform. And so we do that by leaning into that no and low code mindset. So, you know, using things like page builders, full site editing, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, as a developer originally, my preference is always custom development, custom engineering, uh, custom functionality, everything writing in, in, in you know, a text editor. But I, I think in this audience and these personas, again, that's not something they're looking for and having the maintenance requirement of an engineer to be able to adjust functionality, features, whatever it is. And that's sort of a trend WordPress is leaning to already. Um, so it's not the best outcome, but I think uh, it, it's that trade-off of being able to do more in the browser and less uh, with custom code. Uh, WordPress admin is a constant, I think, in anyone who does client services work with WordPress. Uh, it's pretty overwhelming at the best of times, uh, and the visual hierarchy is just all over the place. The, what you're looking for when you're setting a site up uh, and when you're using a site when it's live and running uh, are two different things, but you know, a site that's gone live six months ago is still to see the appearance menu or the comments menu or the tools menu, like these things are irrelevant once you're in a day-to-day -day, um, movement. So how do we get the menu to feel more uh, contextually aware of stuff that is frequent? And that's like stripping it right back to what an editorial team needs to see. They need posts, they need pages, comments, like this is the stuff they're living in day-to-day everything else, and when we've done this, 
some of it's had to be pretty ugly to make it work because it's not a real nice way in core to do this, but to just push everything else out of screen because for most people, uh, once they're in there, this is all they need to see, not that ginormous list of 700 menu items. Making plugins feel more native, I think, is a challenge, and I don't think there's really a simple answer to any of that. But WordPress obviously has a pretty consistent design pattern. Uh, when you're in the admin, through the block editor, uh, it's all fairly consistent. Until you start adding plugins, and when you're using the most common kind of ones, like we'll use Yoast and Newsletter Glue and things like that for, for these sort of projects, they're now using their own design schemes, they're using you know, different forms of tabs and icons and things like that. So all of a sudden you're sort of scrolling through a page and you've now got almost three or four different things it feels like in the same place. So one of the ways we've sort of been able to make that a little bit better without trying to manually rewrite all the styling is thinking about how do you avoid duplication of steps. So if you're using, again, the newsletter glue example and a paywall at the front end, um, you would have to go through here and say, all right, well, this is a you know, paid article. Uh, I don't want people on the website to be able to read it unless, it is, um, unless they've paid. Conversely, though, if you're running a newsletter system that has paying subscribers and free subscribers. In this situation, by default, you would have to go and then manually say, I'd also send this to only the premium list. So they're just these little steps that happen over and over again because they're kind of two plugins all under the one umbrella um, for the editor's experience. And what we did is we worked with Newsletter Glue and they un uh, let us add a bunch of hooks and filters in. So when we're doing these kinds of things, uh, we know that if it's a paid article, it's gonna go to a paid list and things like that. So we can kind of cut half this UI out of the screen altogether. Uh, so from an ed editor's perspective, they can just say, yep, this is a premium article or this is a free article and not have to kind of manually do it in multiple steps because other than it just being clunky, uh, introduces risk of, um, uh, you know, uh, human error and things like that. Uh, so the subscription engine part, so they obviously have to choose whether that's in e-commerce or subscriptions or recurring uh, revenue. There's a few ways to architect this. The two schools of thought are obviously running it inside WordPress using your WooCommerce's, your paid membership pros, things like that. Or there's using like SaaS integrations, something on the cloud that runs all the billing engines and things like that. And I think if you think back to what is important to the personas of who's using this, editorial, not product, not tech, um, the second you add payment, uh, payment systems to a WordPress site, it goes from being something that's really important to now being mission critical. Something like a content site is really just uh, lead capture at this point until you add a billing system. Uh, and the sort of trade-offs you have to make are, uh, if it's content, I have no issues in saying, let's use Word WP Engines, auto updater, it's gonna do some screenshots, it's gonna make a pretty calculated estimate of doing updates and keep the site up to date. But there's no way in the world you would wanna recommend that if you've got a custom billing engine or uh, a payment engine in there as well because that thing's not gonna understand the nuance of failed subscriptions. There's also bottlenecks. We did some work last year um, where they were sort of almost at a theoretical limit of single parallel processing they could do on their site. And any time there was a release, they had to figure out a way to pause it only short enough because if it was paused for too long, it would never be able to catch back up again because it could only process one subscription at a time. And as it was growing, it wouldn't do that. So our preference is usually to use SaaS uh, products, things like at the low end, like Memberful or Pico, uh, up to your Recurlies and Chargebees and Chargeifies and all these other tools. Uh, so you build your API connections between and let it do all the heavy lifting. It's gonna deal with all the security, PCI compliance, uh, all your reporting and number crunching uh, of, of analytics and data and things like that, especially at scale. If you've got 50,000 active paying subscribers, trying to run that off a back end of a shared hosting platform isn't gonna result in any fun for anyone. Uh, and they're also going to manage all the plumbing between all the different tools that you don't have to worry about. So that's how we sort of think about that. And then if you are going to go down that path, back to that chart of when the lines converge and, and use something up, you know, building your own to start with, it's the premise that there's never going to be a perfect time to do a migration. They're always going to suck. Um, and that's because these platforms, while they tick a box and say, we give you access to everything, they don't have to make it incredibly easy for you to leave. Uh, to use Substack as an example, you know, they will give you a full export of the data set, but you're gonna get a zip file with one CSV file with all your emails in it, and then a directory full of HTML files, which is not an easy way to migrate that into a CMS, especially if it's uh, been iterated on over a period of time. 
Um, when we've done some of these large ones that just couldn't be done manually, uh, we've had to build WPCLI functions that will basically scrub and scrub and scrub the data because there's inline CSS, there's inline JavaScript and call to actions. It's pretty messy and trying to reverse engineer static HTML files against the production site so you can grab the schema data to then build it in WordPress. It's technically a data migration, but it's not a very pleasant one to do at that point. So it's being realistic that it's going to be painful whenever it happens, um, and it's just going to have to happen. And then that's, the, so the summary I think is that this creator world and these new versions of media companies are definitely uh, here to stay and they're growing. The industry is continuing to add you know, different versions of this. We're seeing new incarnations of how people are starting. Um, the platforms uh, that, are, that uh, are definitely interesting and, and there's definitely learning of what they're doing well, what they're not doing well, but how does WordPress uh, remain competitive in that space, either as a something out of the box or through people who implement WordPress, um, you know, so that it can continue to sort of serve that purpose uh, for, for businesses that are trying to do more than just sort of the status quo uh, and, and the sort of heavy amount of lifting and thinking that sort of has to be done at the moment to get to that point. Uh, so that was my sort of uh, talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. We do have some time for questions, if anyone has a question for Ben. So you, you've been working on migrating the creators that are starting on these other platforms and bringing them into WordPress. What yep. types of people have you seen the most that are making those migrations? Like from what uh, industries have you worked with the most? So I mean, most of these are <clears throat> in some sort of specialty niche, and I think that works really well for um, anyone who builds an audience really organically. So uh, some of them are in like in politics, some of them are being just like local news. So like the hyper local news thing is like this other trend that's sort of really been bubbling up over the last couple of years as well. Um, actually, there's been a few politics, I think. Um, and others have just been like uh, sports. So the, 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 the industries themselves or the verticals have been a bit all over the place. I think the, the catalysts behind a lot of them have been, we've just, we can't grow anymore the way we are. Um, when you get into sort of more serious, like when they become a business and they start thinking about it as a business, you know, if you're doing audience acquisition, you're spending money on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter to like get people to sign up. If you can't like build the funnel with analytics, you're basically just throwing money at a wall. And you know, we've worked with people who are spending 20K a week like in, in trying to build subscribers. And when someone screws up something in the analytics and it's, they've just they've, they have no visibility. So it's like these things of when do you realize you have to graduate out of sort of like consumer tools to like business tools. Um, and that's where like migrating those sub stacks uh, as an example of they've just sort of hit all of them in different ways, but hit theoretical limits. Um, some of them have been like, I don't want people, I don't, I don't want to be in the same place as somebody else who's also on the platform, like, you know, somewhat more ideological arguments, which aren't business arguments as much, I guess. Um, but it's been, it's been a really mixed bag. Um, but they've all had sort of the same pain points and, and workflow that they're trying to achieve. Yeah. One of the issues we've seen is uh, membership numbers and users on WordPress. How do you deal with really large membership sites that start to grow into the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, do you move those off WordPress to a third party like uh, IDAM solution? How do, how do you handle that challenge? Yeah, obviously, and obviously the, the, the reason that becomes so challenging is not necessarily the size of the users, but it, 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 you start having uncached traffic and, and big large chunks of audience on there. Um, I mean, there's two ways people, like two ways these are being done. So there's either like complete client side SaaS products which I'm not the biggest fan of, but they certainly achieve that sort of objective really quickly where they'll be doing single sign-on through some sort of identity system and then basically it's like a leaky paywall. You can just like kill JavaScript and bypass that altogether. Um, I think if, so to slightly contradict the point about using like page builders and off the shelf stuff, if you're getting into a site where you've got 100,000 paying subscribers, you probably don't need to be doing like a $20 theme. You can probably like, the economics of it change a little bit. And that's where if you can sort of start to work through like proper cash management and stuff like that, because ultimately logged in users still 
uh, have the same experience other than access to there's only two cache states. It's not like econ of 100,000 unlogged in users um, all doing different dynamic requests. So we've had luck yeah, being really clever about like state management with, or cache state management um, to prevent that. There's still, like, I still like the simplicity, like the anti-complexity kind of thing of them being natural users in, in WordPress, managing that through API, through REST API. So uh, you know, if you're using a system that says someone's, you know, they're dunning, they've, they've failed payment, they're expired, whatever, just having a simple webhook ping us, uh, we verify that it's happened, and they know that, and the other system knows that it's happened. Um, otherwise, yeah, you go down that sort of identity management system, which we've done a couple of times, and these are probably not really even creators now, but just more general, you know, big membership media sites. Uh, and, and sometimes they're ones that are like now bordering into headless stuff. So almost Next.js is dealing with your identity management and state management to something like Auth0 or, or something like that. And it's almost completely abstracted from WordPress at that point, um, other than going like, yeah, full native application and trying to be really clever about cache management so you don't have everything yet yeah, natively blowing up. So based on what you've just said, when is the right time for, with your experience with the large media companies, when is the right time to start looking at headless for a creator company or a media company? Is there a checklist, or what's the process behind thinking this might be a good solution? Yeah, I headless is a funny one. I've got a lot of thoughts on it, on headless in general. Um, I think part of the general sense of there's a lot of people who are wanting to jump straight into headless for any reason at all. Uh, the simplest site we can take, let's go build it in a totally decoupled architecture. Um, we've worked over the last two or three years on some like. Uh, probably sevens and, and, and higher figure projects where we've gone down outside of our recommendation down this headless approach. And the sort of most disheartening thing is when they are so overly engineered, uh, they have such big teams to power these things, to build them, and then you finally get to the launch and they are working worse than a $12 off-the-shelf theme uh, from a performance perspective. They're buggy, they're, you know, um, they're creating infinite issues in, in AWS and auto-scaling and stuff like that. So. I don't think no one should ever do headless ever. I think there's a, the sort of pendulum swings of like this is the latest and greatest, everything should be headless. We talk most people out of headless who will come to us and say, oh, we need this, and then we'll talk through the reasons why, and they're just doing a WordPress site, like, and they think it's faster, and it's like, well, it's nothing to do with how it's rendered, it's the fact that there's 800 different ad tech providers or analytics things that are running, and that's all gonna be on the headless site. So people's motivations sometimes get a bit skewed. Um, I think the main thing when I would say that it makes sense is when you're pulling in multiple data sources and significant amounts of data. Um, if it's like 95% WordPress, it may just be simpler to like bring that data into WordPress and store it there and then push it all out the same way. But if you are genuinely pulling in like a full e-commerce system, a full content system, if WordPress isn't the majority anymore, that makes a lot more sense to go like a, a fully API driven headless approach. That's my typical sort of thing. That was my other idea of a talk for WordCamp this year, um, was to whinge about headless for half an hour. Um, but that's my, that's my sort of simplified thoughts on, on the headless uh, argument. Hey. Uh, so we talked about, sorry, <laughs> Substack uh, creator economy. I'm wondering like how it would look like to migrate a social media creator like somebody from TikTok or uh, somebody who is I have the Instagram reel as their core business because um, like the feature is one part uh, like we can have a newsletter glue we can have WooCommerce take care of payment but the the thing that I'm struggling with social media platform is the network effect. Hmm. And even if we improve editorial experience, say we, we bring something like web stories that Google did or some other tool, even better media library or media management, TikTok like the duet creation, anything that we do in WordPress, the network effect is something that I cannot get my head around. Like uh, any ideas, any thoughts on that? Like, Yeah, I think that's why the newsletter, the newsletter revolution thing has been happening. Um, 
because you're never going to be able to recreate the experience of the TikTok experience on a website, like or even a you know PWA, or like or Google Stories or whatever else. Um, so I think that's where like Twitter buying review a couple of years ago, and now like natively bringing into like the Twitter experience, a lot of people have like to subscribe to my newsletter. Most people aren't even using review; they're just using it like to get the email address and then like API push it into whatever other system they're using, Substack or something. Um, so I think that the the popularity of the email argument is that you're still getting someone's email address um, to try and build that relationship because anyone yeah who builds on a rented garden could have that taken away at any time. Um, that's one of the challenges of any platform. If they go in a different direction, um, you're kind of kind of stuck uh, with your whole business model, I guess. Um, so it's yeah, I think the people who have been doing that well are trying to create something that's useful. Or, or meaningful to like, you know, if they're a fashion TikToker or whatever else, how do they bring some kind of good content to a website that they can kind of peel away or shave away some of that audience, build some direct relationship? Some of it's never going to happen. I don't, like, I don't think you're going to ever recreate the virality of a TikTok, getting like 100 million views in a week or something, and getting them all to go to your website and subscribe to the newsletter. I don't think it's going to happen. But it, you either do nothing or something, and I think that's probably the best way to to try and at least own a bit of that audience and have that first party data, I think. Because um, I don't think building a social network on WordPress is going to be as exciting as uh, using TikTok or Instagram or, or whatever else. One, one up front. So I've found that WordPress is far superior to, say, Squarespace or Wix. But if I have a client and all they're doing is selling, I've had a lot of issues with WooCommerce. And sometimes I'll just say, use Shopify. If that's all you're going to do is sell. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like we, Years ago, we sort of thought, where where do we want to work? We were sort of were just a more general no. We were generalist specialists in WordPress. Like we just did anything in WordPress. Like anything that was complex, we could figure it out. And e-commerce and, and WooCommerce was one of those ones. And we ended up working with like a fashion brand in Australia. And they used to be like on the homepage of WooCommerce. Like they were really big WooCommerce site. And I think that experience kind of put me off doing e-commerce like in PHP and MySQL ever again. Um, because it is just it's a there's definitely reasons to do it and people who specialize in it, but it's not a what well, I saw value in doing, um, and just like you said, not having to worry about plugins or issues or the compatibility between things, and then that compatibility with the front end, and then like you add a Twitter widget, and somehow the JavaScript breaks the checkout experience. Like just that kind of world is for for someone who's doing something really simple to do that, and that's kind of the same comparison with these platforms. Like um, uh, Substack is incredibly simple. Like it looks like something I would have made when I was in high school on a weekend. Like it's just literally two screens of a UI and like a text box. Like it's really simple, but it does do a really good job. At like if you just want to write like a newsletter and send it out and not think about anything and you're not sort of having ideas of grandeur of where it needs to go, it's kind of a fine trade-off. So I'm more than happy to tell people like you either rule it out because they don't have the budget, or even if they think they should spend the money, it's like you should probably go simple. Spend it on building an audience, and then maybe come back when you can actually get a return. Um, because spending all your budget on paying us to build something bespoke is not really going to result in any better of an outcome for a business perspective. Um, so yeah, I think that's why we always have this leaning to SaaS stuff, because it's kind of just all abstracted. It's a black box. Don't have to worry about it. Don't have to worry about yeah having 500 orders all happen at once and crashing your site. It's all just it's somebody else's problem. I think it's a pretty good value exchange to not have to worry about that. Questions? All right, let's hear it again for Ben. Thank you, Thank you Ben.